Rolf Schumann knows both worlds. He was part of the startup Better Place, which raised 850 million euros and was in the section of electric car infrastructure. And as well, he has experience in 20 years uh, working for big companies. And he is right now general manager of platform and innovation at SAP. Hi, I'm today here with uh, Rolf, Rolf Schumann. So um, my first question is, uh, what do you think about innovation? How do you think about innovation? Um, I think innovation sometimes is um, the most overhyped topic and only focus, I think, in the wrong perspective. Um, when I see innovation, it is for me really um, just to make a difference and um, drive change. And um, when people talk about innovation, they often talk about or think about this, um, like the iPhone changing the most disruptive way, complete life of the society. And um, when, when I see innovation, often innovation happens in so many different areas. So, of course, this disruptive, super cool technology-driven um, change is the coolest way of innovation. But also innovations like um, cost leadership is something which is amazing. Um, or neutralization. When you look, for example, there are so many companies who just neutralize because of their market power um, other ideas or really just come up as the second follower but can drive this with cost leadership, this is also a kind of innovation. And um, this I, I call it um, disruption, neutralization, as well cost leadership. All these are kinds of innovation. You can be, as a cost leader, can be innovation. And then, of course, you have the failed attempts where sometimes ideas come out, you know, the 3M posted as one of the typical um, failed attempt, which turned into innovation and, of course, um, waste. So um, a lot of innovation is just waste because it didn't work out. But you have, what I say, the learning effect from failures, which I also declare as innovation. So for me, innovation is everything to change things, um, but not only in a kind of disruptive way, but also in other areas. So how do I best know that I'm innovative right now? Um, for me, you know best that you're innovative when you change behavior. When you change behavior of people or when you change behavior of things, how they work, or machine behavior, um, which will then impact in a significant change and improvement of the situation before. An improvement could be, as I described before, um, gain market share, disrupt markets, um, drive innovation, improve uh, situations or change, uh, change situations. That's definitely very serious. So you try always to go first on the behavior and then you just check back that the numbers also increase, but you first always concentrate on the behavior, right? Absolutely. So for me, um, I, I learned, um, especially with our failure at Better Place, I learned if you can't change the behavior of the people or the behavior how things work, which I call machine behavior, um, you should stop doing things. Other people say you have to be customer-centric, but then you have to bring added value, which is a behavior change where people love doing the things. Yeah, that's correct. Can can you can you go a bit deeper in the example from your startup experience there? So you build an uh, electric car infrastructure, right? Exactly. So um, we founded two thousand eight uh, a company called Better Place, and uh, it was a clean tech venture. I think at this time the most um, successful clean tech venture. We raised a, a huge amount of um, capital, um, almost a billion US dollars um, in cash and in kind. Um, and the idea was have an infrastructure of cars to give you a sustainable drive, which means um, drive uh, uh, deliver mobility um, without fossil fuel. This means electric cars, fully electric, um, with a comp combined system of charge spots and um, switchable batteries. So we had a battery switch system. And um, this worked out in, in Denmark, all the, partially with taxi fleets in the Netherlands and also um, Tokyo. Um, and the interesting piece was we were not electric cars um, as the, the, the focal point. It was a mobility service provider. So you were buying miles. You, um, you didn't buy the battery. Um, you just had a car and then you bought miles and you bought mobility, which could also be combined in intermodal systems like with the train system. And um, the infrastructure worked. The software was there. Everything was there. The offering, you could buy it, but it was not successful at the end of the day. And this is why I come to this point of innovation and behavior. And a lot of people were explaining this, that we had been too early, um, the market wasn't ready. And um, when I really made the um, synthesis after the failure, I came to the point that the main reason we had not been successful is because 
we could not change the behavior of the people. Coming up with the idea that you can have an electric car which is more convenient um, or more affordable isn't good enough. Um, and, and, and I realized this when you think about the real top innovations in the world. Um, for example, how Microsoft with Word was changing the way you write a text. You know, when you were writing a text or a letter, you used Word, they changed your behavior. Or when you think about um, Apple with the iPod and the way you listen to music, you change the behavior how to listen to music with the iPod and the digital files. Um, or, or take SAP. SAP, they changed the way how accountants did accounting in finance systems. They changed the behavior. So you see, this is where I really figured out how you create a standard or you really made innovation um, successful in the maximum way. And um, the motivation is always different. Market share, other one to save costs or improve processes. So, but it was about the behavior change. And at the end of the day, having just the same car like a car, explaining you that you are more sustainable or you don't need oil or fossil fuels wasn't enough um, to change the behavior. And this is where I figured out um, when you really want to drive innovations and make it successful, look about the consumer, customer, whatever, but the element which you want to influence and figure out what you have to do to change this behavior. And then I would um, say then you have the highest probability to be successful. So that that means you said like it's not enough that like you just say you're environmental friendly and it's more convenient. So would be the solution then more thinking in a way that uh, that Elon Musk said if you build something which already kind of exists or the problem which already exists, you need to be ten times be ten times better than what exists. So not only exactly. be more convenient, but ten times more convenient. This is one thing I would say. In this case, if it's ten times cheaper, it would also have worked. But um, we were more convenient for the same price, which isn't good enough. Um, and and here's the point: if it costs you the same, but you then have the risk that you need to switch your battery and it's new technology, then you stick polluting the environment. Of course, there were some. You always have some niche groups or early adapters who like it, but you want to be innovative and successful. You need the mass market. And um, I think what we had was something different. Um, if you would have sold mobility, if you would sold uh, a new way how to travel or how to be uh, mobile and agile, this would have worked out, but it was too close on the car. And it was yet another car. And um, I think this is where our messaging was wrong and um, our go-to-market. But at this point in time, we thought it was exactly right because the whole discussion was about electric cars and we maybe put the wrong focus to be honest so so the cool thing like we we know a bit now how the market developed so we have at one point we have this whole um shared driving like car to go and um drive now and so on that would be one one kind of like you pay per mile um the other one would be go euro that like you have one search engine and out of the search engine you can like cross search for flights trains buses and so on mm -hmm. um so what do you think would be more going in one of these two directions or in both directions or what do you think would be the better approach there or like how you should have pivoted or involved? I would combine the, I would, combine, I would definitely combine the directions and I'll tell you why. Um, first of all, um, with the share economy, what happens, and this is when I talk about change people's behavior, the car is losing um, its um, attractiveness or the, the whole discussion around the car, my own car, I don't share, it's my thing. So the share economy um, uh, discounts the car by itself. This helps a lot. And then you can offer um, mobility more on a to b and it's less about the car. So this is the reason why the share economy and these new models will definitely help. Um, of course, the automotive industry doesn't like this because they want to sell more car. And what you do in the other way, you're utilizing the existing cars in a higher um, proportion. So, so this is what I'm saying. But this mindset change in the society helps you, first of all, to address this point. And then you say, but it's not just about the car, it's intermodal. You say, okay, for example, you buy for 20,000 um, euros a year, you buy mobility. And then you could go... Um, put one euro per kilometer when you drive by yourself um, it costs you 150 when you go um, by taxi where you have a driver or it costs you less when you share it and um, then suddenly offering any kind of mobility in a transparent easy to use model 
where, for example, when you offer, when you go from A to B, this as a car sharing opportunity and get money from others, that's exactly how you suddenly change this uh, mobility and become a mobility service provider. And this is how I would do it, that you combine any kind of um, getting from A to B and you have different opportunities and then you just have different prices, how you make your miles. And um, at the end, you just calculate it from there. And then when you want to have your privacy, because you want to have some phone calls or just want to go with yourself, you take your miles by yourself. And sometimes you hop on a train and take parts of the whole distance by train and by car, by car sharing or by taxi. And at the end, you pay the full end to end in a very convenient way. This would make a difference. Yeah, that makes sense. So do you do you think it would would have, it would have been possible during this time? Like because you are you are quite early, definitely. Like we, you were really early with your idea because Tesla just made the same, just including the car. They built also a big infrastructure of because they realized you need to have an infrastructure that this whole electric car works. Look, um, I personally think it would have been technology was already there already at this time, so it was there, and. Uh, And this is why I um, why I am so um, convinced that it's not a big deal at all. But the problem was the mindset of the people had not been there. Um, and this is why I'm not sure um, if it's a question of the time. At this time, I think people were not open to share economy. People were not open on... This intermodal driving, they still were very focused on the car. And the whole discussion about electrification was about the car and led by the um, OEMs, you know. Um, maybe we certainly have to figure out what is the right target group. And, for example, we went on the mass market. And you brought the example of Tesla, and they went on the prime market first. And now yeah. on the mass market. So maybe we should have done for um, business travelers, you go another niche segment, And demonstrate it there, or you would have done it for logistic providers. You know, you have to think about um, what you want to change. And we wanted to change the mass market, and um, maybe this was the wrong package for this market at this time. And this is what I'm saying: What do you want to change? Um, and also, when you look at the e-scooter we have today, which came out of logistics, this whole idea had been discussed, discussed there, and they are producing right now. And again. Um, they have taken another segment where they change behavior. In this case, it was the behavior of logistic service providers. And, and this is why I'm saying it's never too early when you have the right package for the right market you would like to change, and then you can go step by step. For example, maybe we should have started with a prime niche market first and then go on this big scale with the same concept. Um, on the other side, when you look, for example, on Apple, um, they went on the consumer market, and out of this great user experience, The devices went into the business area and the business world they didn't address the business um, users first. So uh, it, it's always easy to, to come 10 years later to say what would have been better. But um, I definitely wouldn't say there is never a bad time for a great idea. It's always a great time for a great idea. If you know exactly the right market to address with the right value proposition to change behavior, which drives your success. And this is the only thing I am, um, I accept to be criticized. Yeah. Cool. So if we, if we replace the word innovation with uh, behavioral change, what do you think is the difference between uh, behavioral change in a startup or what a startup tries to do and in a big business? Um, the, main, uh, the main difference between uh, behavior change in, uh, between startups and big business um, is, in my opinion, very, very simple. Um, in the big business, and this is what you have to understand, you have existing processes. And um, in startups, you only have content. You don't have the processes. And this is the big difference between what I say, um, agility, which often people say a startup is more agile. Um, and we do in the big business, um, I talk about scale. So if you really come to the point to say, what is the main difference? It is, you can say, speed and reach, which means um, the, the the scale to, to, to grow on the one hand side and the age on the other side, or as I would say, content versus process. And this is what you have to, it's always the same discussion. A process is about scale. Content is about the speed and then, um, and the reach is again, scale. And then this is what you have to differentiate. So this is why I often see startups dying 
when they get acquired by large companies because people say it's a culture, but I think this is the main difference, what the focus is on. But on the other side, um, when you bring both things together, it's an alien situation. Can you uh, go more specific? So, so I, I give you an example. Um, that there's one very successful um, startup company which works together with SAP. It's called Celonis. And they had a great um, idea about so-called process mining. And I saw them on a hackathon on a startup focus program. And I like this. And uh, what they do is they can um, use existing um, business systems like SAP. And they um, really derive very interesting insights on the special way how they mine the processes, how they happen in the company. So the first question was, um, why can't SAP do that? And it was the reason because of the thinking, the way we are thinking and um, we're set up, we didn't see those content. So there was certainly a niche market and um, they were really focusing only on the content, how to improve this, how to do their process mining. And then we were really thinking about um, we should acquire this company and offer these features by SAP. But I said, at the due diligence, I came to the conclusion saying, when we do this, we will kill these guys. We will kill these kids um, with this great idea. So what we did is we did not um, acquire them to integrate them into SAP. We used them as a partner, made the ref share model, and we used their great content with our scale to existing customers and the processes. And this is now, they are so successful, they found a second investment round, they are now expanding to North America. Um, it's an absolutely success story it's because they had great content in a niche domain. And we had all the, I call it um, access and the reach to any kind of customers who need this content. And then I brought together the go-to-market with their content and our, um, I call it um, uh, reach or scale. I used their speed to bring in the right features and take the customer feedback and that we have a great product. And this was the, I call it the secret source to help them to, to really scale. And this is um, what I can definitely tell you. And both, let's say, um, situations are sexy. And it's very rare that you find both. Um, but of course, in great companies, um, when you look at SAP, you have areas where you have also this content, like our innovation centers or innovation networks. But um, the reason why big companies are successful is because you replicate success by um, replicating in processes um, to achieve scale and margin and profits. And this is what you always have to balance. It's two different modes um, you're running. Like um, you have to keep the lights on and run the company. On the other side, you have to differentiate. But this is the main difference between large, successful, scaling companies and small companies. And then, of course, you have companies, uh, when you look at Apple, who try to be really focused on their product and so on. But then you see very quickly, as bigger you become, as more process-oriented you are, as smaller your innovations will be and you have incremental innovation compared to this huge disruptive innovation which usually comes from startups and then um, this is what you have to know and to leverage and use the best of both worlds um can you can you explain because i, I did, as you as you told the story i was just thinking why you just don't copy their method like their way how they interpret the data um very simple because you don't have the content You can copy one shot, one snapshot, but you won't improve. They make two more steps and um, they improve it. You have to understand the content. A copycat is never better than the original. So you can only neutralize. You could max in, in max, you could neutralize, but you can't make the difference. So, but is it the product what they do, or is it just uh, they do smart data scientists? Or it's a product. No, no, it, it's. Product. No, it's product. Uh, it's a product they have, a cool technology, and then, of course, they, they analyze the data and visualize in a special way to gain the insights. And maybe you can copy two, three, four, five um, point of views you have, but you never can copy the overall system. This is what I'm saying. Um, when you start copying, you just copy the snapshot. And this is good to neutralize, but it's never good to lead the market. And, of course, a, a big company can do this, to kill smaller companies. This often happens. When you use your market um, potential, you copy it and then you go into the with your scale to the market and then you kill the market for them that they don't get into the market. But at the end of the day, if you see the huge potential behind such an idea, it's better to partner together with them, put them on your scale, and in my opinion, um, share the ref, uh, the, make a revenue sharing, which is um, more promising than trying to copy, snapshot it, because you should never forget in a large company, You have thousand priorities, and this never gets the.
like in the small company. This is what people often misunderstand. When you look at a company like SAP, um, your portfolio is huge. And now there's one small thing which is great. So you can copy this, but what, which priority do you have to develop it, to get the content in? And this is where I'm saying you have to balance it. If it's a core element of SAP, and with, when we see that a competitor or in the market, people are trying to attack our core elements, you can be sure that you neutralize them as fast as possible. But if it's something new, you always compete in a large company with the 1,000 other products you have in your company. And this often isn't worth doing it, so you get a really bad copy, which won't make a difference. So they, they were able to, to find a kind of really niche where they found in a certain environment, they found they, they were able to get way better insights in a certain angle than the, than you guys from, from SAP. Because it's your system, almost like you... you. Exactly. i tell you one thing. I was surprised that... 25-year kids, old kids, could gain insights about processes which we couldn't get out. And this is why I thought it was genius what they did. And then we really figured out what to do. Do you have the name of the and company again? Of the Celonis, C E L O N I S. Celonis. Okay, so they 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 were able to find insights and processes you didn't find. Look, what they did is um. SAP is coming from the process um, from the process world. I think there is no company in the world who understands business processes better than us. And then we went on a new technology called HANA. So, and then HANA is an in-memory database technology. So, you don't store data like in the classical pattern. When you store data, you have the data and a timestamp. So, what those kids did, they used the timestamps to figure out how processes had been executed, when happened what. So, it was more like a kind of spy of the behavior, how processes were executed in a system. And this they visualized. And then you see exactly how people go through the processes and what they do. Our thinking was more, we implemented the system and the processes, and then we assumed that the processes run this way. But then they figured out that people were bypassing the processes, don't do it right, and finding new ways to cheat the system or to work with the system. And that's exactly what they found out. But from our setup, when we came in a company as a SSB, You figured out a process, you implemented it, and then you assume that this is executed against this way. And they were more like, we don't care. We look what really happens in the system because we have this great technology. And out of this, they came with process mining. And now you from SAP, of course, you can copy it. And of course, we could put people on. But why should we? They had this great idea. And out of this, they were driving more and more innovation. And if you just copy it, you copy some functions. And this was the reason why we decided not to acquire them because we didn't want to frustrate young people who want to focus on content compared to getting in a huge company scenario and also not to copy it. Um, and uh, th this is how I think large companies and small companies should work together. And this is how we usually um, feed our ecosystem. When you have great niche ideas to extend SAP, our partners in the ecosystem know that we um, give them the, the market share and we collaborate together. And um, I think also, As a big company, you have to know your core business very well. You have to know your investment field, where you really want to go into, where you see growth. And you have to know where you have niche domain players who are really extending your offering in a um, tremendous way to give them the chance and access to your high-scale network on the one hand side to gain their great insights and content. And this is why I'm saying the scale and the content are the two different main differences between those two worlds. But it doesn't mean that you can't coexist. I even think the coexistency of those two worlds make it so special. Yeah. I think it was also one of the big, or that is one of the big secrets of SAP, why you got so big. You had like just a really good eco ecosystem where you let all participate on your success and you try to help your partners to make a good services, to build a good ecosystem around it. And... Um, Yeah, I I've, I've thought I read the article about it, that this is one of the secrets why SAP becomes so big, the ecosystem around it. There, there's multiple secrets, um, I would say, but this is one of the key segments of the growth. Um, and um, the, uh, I, I, there's one, yeah, one, one story of our founder, our co-founder, Mr. Hopp. Um, so Dietmar Hopp always said, um, when we make one euro with a customer, the partner should have also one euro. So it was never that we said uh, we make a ref share and we have to more. It was what we make, the ecosystem should also make. I can tell you why the ecosystem makes even more money. But this fairness, because I think the cake is big enough to share, 
was exactly the reason. And to be very clear, what do what they do. A lot of system implementation partners, and we also have our own de uh, consulting department, which you would say don't they compete? No, because you work together, and you limit at the point where you say I need it for a certain, um, I call it maturity, and initial growth. But for the scale, I have the others, and they knew how to make money with it because they also always knew that there was a fair share. And this is um, our success, but also when you look, for example, on the um, iTunes um, App Store, how um, Apple is treating the developers of apps was a similar approach. Um, you know, they made a ref share model on a transparent way and gave them access to this community. Very simple, very And this is why I'm saying, understand what are the core strengths of each individual party, find the synergies, and then um, show respect how to work together. So um, let's let's uh, step back a bit and let's... Um, next question I would have is, what for advice would you give someone who's going into a leadership the first time? Like, how, how he should prepare? Like, what should he know? So the... The first advice I give is ignore any advice. <laughs> so I, I, no, I, there are so many people who give you these great advices. Um, uh, uh, you, you have to experience it. I, I think if you're a leader, you will experience it. And if you're not a leader, you, you or if you're a bad leader, you will stay a bad leader. So I think leadership is a thing of personality. And everything you can learn about it is um, to improve. But you have to have this gene of getting people behind you, motivate them. And this is um, what I can tell you um, from my personal experience. So I don't give advices. I just can share personal experience. A great leader gets even better people behind him. This is the first thing. And um, if you want to attract people, if you want to attract great people, this really works only via content. If you don't have content and insights, people don't get um, inspired by you. And then you suddenly realize that great people pull in other great people. I even would say which are smarter, but they give them the environment to, do, to combine the smartness of multiple people to make something great nobody can do by themselves alone. And this is all about leadership. And then when you usually come into companies, there are different styles how to, to make career or whatever. And some people focus only on the process. They are, like, I, I call it like general managers focusing on the process. Um, and they are focusing on one lineup and a lot of politics. Um, I always try to stay out of politics because this is maybe short term, fast and quicker. But in the long run, there's nothing which um, makes you authentic. And um, great leadership at the end is you're an authentic person and you have great content. And I always invest most time in content, not in processes. And with this content, people like what you say and people follow you. And this makes you stronger. And whenever I have the feeling that I have a team where I'm the smartest, it's the wrong team or I'm wrong. When I go into a meeting and I have the feeling that I'm the smartest in the room, I'm in the wrong meeting. And um, the only experience I made is with content, sometimes it takes longer to be successful. But you know what? It lasts much longer and it makes a much more happier life as a leader because people see you on a total different level. And politics, I know this is very famous and happening all the time, but this is the, the downside of leadership. And um, I don't think this is um, what should be the right way. So when you start getting there, people say this is naive to believe only in content. I can tell you all of those people who told me this, they were gone or done over a certain time. And those who were in with strong content, they, are, they last almost forever. But again, um, You have to love it. You have to love to lead other people. You have behind you become your fans. And um, if you don't feel this, um, stay an expert. One thing I learned at SAP, the best developers are not automatically the best managers or leaders. On the other side, the best leaders are very seldom the best developers, I can tell you. Yeah. Um, can we can we go a bit deeper in the context of uh, you are a manager in a big company and uh, because then you're probably way more into a politics thing than like in a startup context. So, and you're also way more confronted with process than with content. Um, how how would you apply that? How you would how you would um, how you can make sure that you apply the principles you set. 
the, the thing is, you have to find your style. And I can tell you, um, people with strong content are usually the, the hardest people to manage and they are pain in the butt, I can tell you. People who are strong in content, um, they are challenging. Um, they have edges. And um, so it's sometimes um, people don't like them and it's hard to find the right managers. But as I said, when you're strong in content, you will find your leader and you find your fans. This is how I had it. I never had um, the issue that I didn't find good managers, but those I found, they respected your strengths. And um, this is how I live all the day. And they also protect you from the politics. I, I had um, managers who said, here's the point, Rolf. I need you because I know you can disrupt this market, you can disrupt this business, you can drive it, you have great content. I manage the politics for you. Sometimes you have these kind of deals and um, you have to understand your strengths and your weaknesses. And I can tell you, I know exactly my weaknesses. I mean, look at my team. They are exactly filling up the weaknesses I have with the strengths they are. So, so this is why I'm saying you have those situations all the time. And um, this is how I manage it by, um, uh, for myself. And um, sometimes you're frustrated because people who do politics are free of content, maybe for short term, even uh, overtake you in the career path or get the better project. But what I learned in the long run, they all disappear and you survive. And then this is how I can really tell you out of my experiences how it works. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Um, what would what would you say is your biggest challenge today? Your focus today? Process versus content. When you're in a company like SAP, I can tell you there are so many processes um, which are so far away from content, and this is what you have to manage. And SAP is a company who really runs simple. I can tell you internally. I also worked ten years at Siemens. Processes is the biggest challenge, which don't make sense where you see, okay, this is just invented because you want to scale away from the real content, you know that it's wrong. But um, a big company, when you have to change it, it takes so long time to transform it. And this is the format or the time frame where the processes are hindering you and where you get more and more frustrated compared to um, what you really would like to achieve. Yeah, awesome. Um... So another question, what do you do to invest in yourself? What do you do, do you do to educate yourself, for example? Read, talk, listen. <laughs> this is what I do. I, I, I really am reading tons of information and I'm watching and we have so much. This is what the internet brought to me. You can read thousands of pages a month and you have all this access. You find a lot of people you gain access. Um, you have those networks um, where you challenge yourself, where you get challenged. And you listen to others and try to to understand what it is, and this is um, how I how I personally am investing myself all the time. It's knowledge, new ideas, leaving your comfort zone, and also leaving your industry. Listen to others. Um, right now, I I can tell you, people underestimate um, the magic of um, arts, music, um, to open your mindset. These kind of things. So you're all over the place and then you just check what's what's interesting? Um, so what I usually do is I have some, I'm paying money for content. So I'm reading a lot of paid content where I have the right quality. And out of this, then you see in social media when you have the right topics, um, what is discussed, what is happening. You find the YouTube videos, you find other people. And then you have your network with people where you talk all the time, the ideas, what you heard. And you challenge yourself and get challenged. This is how you, how I think the investment should be. It's a mixture of reading, understanding, taking this, talking to others, listen to others' opinion, and also see how they live. This, this is what it really is. So, so when you say you invest in paid content, like is it in books or is it seminars or is it just uh... mainly, mainly, mainly I read um, tons of books. Um, Coming in ebooks, then you have newspaper, daily newspapers with high quality content. And then, of course, out of this, you go into the public internet, what you find there. And then uh, don't underestimate how many YouTube videos you find with great presentations um, from really great people. So, you do, I, I think I didn't um, touch a manual for years. Um, because if I want to understand how some things work, you go on YouTube, you watch five um, YouTube videos, and you know how the things work. And then, um, if you really want to go in deep dive, you buy the really expert book and you read this in depth. So, so this is how it, um, how I do it. Or you start with the expert book, then check out the the videos, and in between, 
We have everyday blogs, we have everyday podcasts, we have everyday news. Um, and here my experience was there's a lot of free content, which is okay. And then you have paid content, um, which qualifies much better for your domain or your niche, what you're looking for. And this is the combination I have. And uh, I can tell you the most used device in my life is um, my, my iPad with the ebooks and um, the ebook readers and all the stuff. Yeah, awesome. So, all of out of the books you read, uh, what are your favorite books? Um, <laughs> so, I, right. I, usually, I read multiple books in parallel. So, right now, I I, th I have four books I'm reading in parallel. Um, so, so this is um, Day After Tomorrow about innovation. Um, this is funny. Then I'm reading Challenge Management from Klitschko, um, where uh, a boxer was coming in, showing his expertise transferring business. I, I read Fire and Fury because everybody was talking about it. Um, and then the book from Christian, Lindia, uh, Christian Lindner, when he was out of the government um, around this whole coalition discussion, I read this. And um, yeah, I read this sometimes here, 100 pages there, there. I read all this in parallel. And um, yeah, this is what I do all the time. So it's from politics. Oh, the book I read before was Jerusalem, which was a book about the history of Jerusalem. You, you know, you see in the in the news um, a conflict about Palestine, Israel, and then yeah, you find the right books. And um, and then the other book I was reading was about Da Vinci. So the the author um, Isaac Walton from uh, the biography from Steve Jobs wrote a book about Leonardo da Vinci, which is which is awesome. So. This is um, the books I read in the last few weeks, um, which really impressed me. So, but this is um, permanently. I'm traveling a lot, so this is the way I survive the the travel time. Wow! So, is it an also the way you take off, where you can switch off, or what you do to get like um, to keep sanity from work? Uh, I do everyday sports. So in the morning, I do at least half an hour of sports. Um, With one, you should you should sweat half an hour a day. So this is my my rule. And when I have really time, I go on um, playing golf. So this is what I what I do. So when I have a lot of time, I'm on the golf course. And if not, do some workout, um, running, biking, stepping. This is what I do. But this is more when you travel a lot with jet lag. This is what you have to do to survive um, by default. And when I really have time, I, I love to swing my totally networked golf clubs with all the analysis while you play bad. Okay, um, and I have another question. Like, if I want to dive deeper into your whole your whole concept of um, content and the process, what would you recommend to start in? To be honest, read the biographies um, of Steve Jobs because he is the best example when things failed. Because this is how Apple failed. Um, how he came back, what he was doing, Apple. This is where I saw him. Read the biography about um, Steve Jobs and then you understand exactly what I mean. But to be honest, if I think about it, I I see the way how he's like he was really focused on content, but I see also out of what I memorize of it that like he needed to go. Like he was he would have driven down Apple. Like he was he was not mm, He didn't. He didn't put it in the right context. Sometimes he was just sometimes too far out of um, of what what needed for the company or how you would see this. Especially the first time he left or he was kicked off out of Apple. Mm, that was exactly the point. So when you look on the what he tried to do, when you take Lisa, so this was the point where he was kicked out. Lisa against the Mac team. Um, this is where you had um, at Lisa. You had fantastic processes. But um, horrible content. Um, this was exactly the point. Then they almost ruined Apple, and this is why we had to go. But at the end, it was he didn't understand. So for example, the price they had for for Lisa, I think it was ten thousand bucks. And from the process side, like when when you came from the mainframe world with from HP at this time um, or Tandem or whatever, this was a great price. But he, it was designed for other people in the household, so it couldn't work. And this is why the Mac was the better point in time content at this time and the content for Lisa was great even too big but the process is killed it so this is how I see it so I do not say Steve Jobs was always great but um, 
Definitely not. But what I learned about him, he knew exactly when content was right and when process was right. And in today's world, you only optimize on process usually and you only do in content. So these are the two extremes. And this is exactly what you see during his life and um, his business life. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So my last question is, uh, if you could do a restart as an 18-year-old, what would you do? I would do it exactly as I did it. Look, uh, here's the point. I started working with 16 in the data center of Siemens. So this is why my playground was a data center. And um, uh, maybe I would travel more when I was young. Um, so um, I, I, I never had an issue with working hard and working long hours. And uh, I, I liked it. So I would say I would do everything again at the same time. Maybe I would found a company earlier. So the first time I found a company as an entrepreneur and then failed was with um, 35. This was maybe too late. This is the only thing. Uh, maybe I would earlier take the risk to found own company because as older you are, the higher the risk will be. And um, you're in a comfort zone. You have a lifestyle um, which prohibits you doing this. But the thing is I would do, I would love technology, work hard, learn a lot, brace content and knowledge and people. And maybe... Um, being more or earlier an entrepreneur and trying to run own businesses. Maybe this is the only thing, but also this you can do with mid 30. There is no, there is no, um, I call it the age limit. And, um, one thing I learned is, um, a lot of people, especially when we spoke about career before, um, a lot of people think there are short, uh, shortcuts and you can do things on a shortcut. The only thing I learned, and this is why I say with everything, do exactly the same way is there are no shortcuts for success. Um, and you know what? Um, there is no speed limit on the extra mile. And this is what makes the difference. I'm a strong believer that hard work will pay out. And um, the only place you find success before work is the dictionary. Yeah. Awesome. So just, just out of curiosity, would you go in a big company as 18 year old after school or would you study or would you do both study and big company or would you be entrepreneur right away? What, what do you think? Very simple. It depends on the project they give you. If they give you in a big company, the chance to participate in a great project, great content, which you love and you would dedicate for go there. There is no reason not to do it. If you don't have a topic you would like, don't do it. Um, This is um, this old um, statement, love it, change it or leave it. And in every great company, as I said, innovation could also be cost saving, um, neutralization. It's the question which challenge they give you. And if the challenge is exactly what you love, what you're working for, go there. There And if it's in a small startup and they have no great idea, don't do that. So this is what I'm saying. And if you find some people, guys who are crazy enough with you to have the same wave thing and you have the great idea, do it. So... For me, the content dictates you what you should do and you feel it. You don't need an external consultant for this. You feel if this is why it's worth getting up in the morning. And this is the only question. What drives you to get up in the morning? I think that's like also awesome last words. Oh, uh, you want to say something for, for the end? We missed something, but... Um... Um, maybe the only thing I can say, we, we live right now in a time which is um, incredible because... The technology is there, the access to technology is there. It was never easier to get access to any kind of um, compute power, machine learning, data, big data. And um, the whole society, this whole world is changing with this new technology. And the next 10, 15 years, the whole world will change completely. People talk about digital transformation, but we never had the situation that access to technology and data and connectivity and compute power and speed had been as big as right now. So... I'm so looking forward for those who embrace technology to enable better life or better things for whomever is here. And this is why I can tell you, I think there was not never a better time to live like now because um, uh, there will be so many great new things driving prosperity for the people that those who have great ideas should just do it. Yeah. Do you think that machine learning will, will be a... Uh our biggest problem in the future or will be our biggest solution in the future? Like the what's coming out of machine learning, like the AI? Look, I think it's the biggest solution for us because it will help us to drive 
um, productivity to a level we never could imagine and driving productivity to these um, levels will drive prosperity. And um, as long, and this is how I see it, as long as there won't be artificial awareness, which is exactly what differentiates us from machines, um, and we work together with the machines, it's great. The only question is if we as a society will be able to combine the power of machine learning or artificial intelligence with our um, power of um, being having awareness, creativity, and how we can get the new prosperity and the increased productivity back into our society that everybody has a purpose in this life. Um, it is um, the best thing which could happen to us. So do you think the, the machine, like the AI, will have no self-awareness? Not, not in the near future. As long as we in, uh, invest for our kids, people, in creativity, arts, music, they won't do this. This is, I think, the main difference between today. Okay, awesome. That's maybe <laughs> a, a topic for the next time. <laughs> for the next. Thank you very much, John. Uh, it, it was okay. an absolute pleasure. And then uh, see you next time, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you much. Bye. Take care.